This program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. talk about a topic today that frankly most churches today won't touch they, they don't talk about it you never hear it mentioned it's a word that's very rarely heard in the church anymore I listen to a lot of we used to call them preachers now we call them communicators and I listen to a lot of communicators I never ever hear a communicator talk about what I'm going to talk about today they never ever use this word now it doesn't bother me because I know that I'm in good company when I talk about this because the first word that Jesus ever used in the first sermon he ever preached was this word. And Jesus even said, if you don't do what this word commands you to do, you can't have a relationship with God. It doesn't matter how religious you are or how good you are, how often you attend church, whether or not you give to a church, whether or not you serve in a church, none of those things matter. If you don't do what this word commands you to do, Jesus himself said, you cannot have a relationship with God. And if you do have a relationship with God, Jesus said, this is something you really have to do on a continuous basis if you're going to maintain fellowship with God. And the word we're going to talk about today is the word repent. Now I want you to say that word out loud, okay? Repent. Turn to the person next to you and say repent. Yeah, it'll make you feel like a preacher, okay? Now, let me, let me just tell you, let me tell you what you think of when you hear this word, and it's why we don't use it. You, you think about these guys that wear these sandwich boards, you know, they walk up and down streets, and they got this word, you know, turn or burn, they got, you know, a flame on the back, and, and, and they've got, you know, they, they, in fact, some of them even look like the devil, okay? And, and, and so you get this word, and you say, man, I, I just, I cannot believe, you may have brought a neighbor with you today and said, I can't believe it, you, I bring this neighbor, and now you're going to talk about Repent. Well, let me just hang in there. Let me just kind of tell you why and, and, and why we're doing this. We're in a series called Fault. And if you were not here last week, let me refresh your memory. Or if you were here, if you weren't here, let me kind of tell you where we are. We were talking about earthquakes. And earthquakes are caused by faults. And I told you last week that, that what a geological fault is. As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. When I was preparing this sermon several weeks ago, you may have read the newspaper that in San Francisco and in Peru, they both experienced pretty big earthquakes. And roads were destroyed and homes were leveled and some people died. And it really caused a lot of damage and electricity was, you know, taken out and so forth. And I told you last week that what causes an earthquake is when a layer of the surface of the earth separates. It shifts. It's called a fault. And there's a shift vertically and there's a shift horizontally. And when that shift takes place, that causes tremors, that, in, 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 that, that causes a chain reaction, that causes earthquakes. And I said last week that life is just like that. That all of us in this room have what we call faults. We've got personal faults. And sometimes those faults come out. And, and they cause massive earthquakes in relationships. Now if you remember, if you were here last week, let's see how good your memory is. The Bible calls those faults what? Sin. The Bible calls those faults sin. So what you and I call a fault, the Bible calls sins. What we said last week was that whenever relationships are ruptured, one of two things are usually true. If there's a fracture in a friendship or a rupture in a relationship, either primarily it's not my fault, it's yours, or it's not your fault, it's mine. There's always somebody at fault. There's no such thing as a no-fault rupture relationship. There's no such thing as a no-fault fracture in a friendship. Whenever two people get separated, whenever two people have conflict, either one person's more at fault, the other person's more at fault. Rarely, sometimes they're equally at fault. But usually, either it's my fault, not yours, or it's your fault, not mine. So what we're doing in this series is we're, is we're simply telling you if you want to repair a relationship that's been ruptured, 
If you want to amend a marriage that's been broken, if you want to fix a friendship that's been fractured, first thing you've got to ask yourself honestly is this, who caused this earthquake? Is it my fault primarily, not theirs, or is it their fault primarily, not mine? Now, if you say, okay, well, I have to be honest, it's my fault. I'm really the one that caused it. I'm the one that messed up. I'm the one that caused the tremors. I'm the one that caused the rupture. We're dealing with that situation. Then in a couple of weeks, we're going to flip it. And this is kind of the harder part, to be honest with you, because for some reason, it's much harder for us to fix a relationship when we're not the ones that broke it. When it's their fault, not ours, here's the attitude we take. Hey, buddy, I didn't break it. I ain't going to fix it. You broke it. <clears throat> you fixed it. I'm waiting by the phone. Give me a ring, okay? I'm not approaching you. I'm not the one that caused it. I'm not the one that made us separate. I'm not the one that caused this rupture. You did it, and I am waiting on you to fix it. We're going to find out in a couple of weeks that is not the way that relationship is to be prepared. That said, last week we said that when we sin, when the fault is ours, when we've done the wrong thing, we said the first thing we've got to do is start at the epicenter. If you weren't here last week, let me just tell you what the epicenter is. The epicenter of an earthquake is where an earthquake begins. Where an earthquake is felt is not necessarily where an earthquake begins. Because, for example, we told you back in February when Atlanta had an earthquake, you remember that, the earthquake didn't start in Atlanta, it was just felt in Atlanta. The earthquake actually started in South Carolina. That's where the epicenter was. We said, likewise, every time there's a rupture in a relationship, it's our fault, we're the ones that did it, we're the ones that broke it, we're the ones that caused the separation. We said last week that every fault always begins with our relationship to God. Because any time you ever sin, any time you ever do anything wrong, even if you hurt someone else in the process, it's always first against God. So we said that the first step you've got to take to correct a self-inflicted sin is confession. So we talked about that. We said, look, whenever you do anything wrong, even if you think it's primarily against someone else, you've always sinned against God because sin is always first against God. So whenever you do something wrong, the first one you go to is you go to God and you seek His forgiveness. Then we said after you get God's forgiveness, then you go to the person that you wrong and you seek forgiveness from them. Now, last week we gave you the very good news. We said last week God has a perfect record when it comes to forgiveness. Every time you confess your sin to God and ask God to forgive you, God forgives you. Every time. As a matter of fact, you talk about what good news that is. You know what? If God only forgave us 99.99% .99 of the time, we'd be up the creek. We'd be in trouble. I don't need God to forgive me 99 times out of 100. I need God to forgive me every single time. And we said last week, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the problem. The problem is too often when we do things wrong, when we hurt other people, here's the way we usually handle it. We'll say, God, I realize I hurt my wife. I realize I hurt my friend. I realize I hurt this person. God, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? And we kind of stop there. Well, that won't take care of the problem. Or we'll go to God and say, God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I messed up. Would you please forgive me? And we'll go to the other person and say, I messed up. I'm sinned. I'm wrong. Would you please forgive me? And we think that will solve the problem, but it doesn't. Because there's a second step that has to be taken if you're going to repair a relationship. And I call this the seismic shift. Now a seismic shift is when there is a shifting in the rock so great, in the layer of the surface so great, it doesn't just cause an earthquake, it causes a massive earthquake. And there is a seismic shift that has to take place within us and with us and with our sin if we're truly going to maintain our fellowship with God, if we're really going to have a relationship with God, and that is in the word repentance. Now, before I really get into this, let me just tell you one other thing. Here's why I'm talking about this topic. Here's the number one reason why. Jesus gave the church a job to do. If, you're not a, if you don't know much about the Bible, I'm going to use a term we use in church. It's called the Great Commission. You don't need to remember that word. It's simply the job description that Jesus gave to the church. And just before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, this is the church's number one job. If you don't do this, you're out of business. 
Your number one job is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world with anybody that's willing to hear it. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Go share Jesus. All right, so we know that. Those of us that go to church, yep, heard that many times. That's our job. However, what a lot of us don't realize is Jesus not only told us what our job is, he told us how to do it. He even told us the message that we're to take to the world. And in, in, in Luke, of, of all the Gospels, Luke alone records the exact content of the message that Jesus has commanded us to preach. So if you want to know what our message is, the number one message in the church, here it is. Jesus commanded in Luke 24, 47. Listen to this. And that, what's that word? Well, let's say it real loud. <laughs> Repentance. All right. So this is what Jesus, not what I'm saying, it's what he said. Jesus said, I want repentance and forgiveness of sins to be proclaimed in my name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, this is one of the things that kind of sets us a little bit apart. You can go to any church in Atlanta today, almost any church that halfway even preaches the Bible. And there are a lot of churches that preach the Bible. I'm not throwing down on any church. You go to any church in Atlanta today, one thing you'll probably hear most likely They'll talk about Jesus as the Savior of the world. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus paid for our sins. And if you'll ask Jesus to forgive you, he will forgive you. You'll hear that in almost any church. But you know what you won't hear in 99% of the churches today? You won't hear that word right there. Never hear it. I listen, to, I listen to communicators all the time. Never hear that word. It is never even mentioned. And yet, if I'm going to preach what Jesus preached, I have to preach repentance. And so there may be some preachers out there that are going to be listening to this message later on. So let me just kind of, kind of put you on hold for a minute and just say a word to all my fellow preachers out there. If you're not preaching repentance, you're not preaching what Jesus told you to preach. You're not preaching what Jesus told you to preach. One of these days, I've got to give an account as to what I preach in this book. To every sermon, I've got to give an account. And if I don't preach repentance, one of these days, Jesus is going to look at me and he's going to say, you know, James, you talked about forgiveness and you talked about grace and you talked about love and you talked about mercy, but you never talked about repentance. And I believe I even put that first. So when I preach on repentance, I'm just doing what Jesus told me to do, okay? So if you don't like it, take it up with him. I just want to be there when you have the conversation, okay? Now look. Here's what we're going to do. If you brought a copy of God's Word this morning or you've got an iPad or a tablet or whatever you brought, I want you to you know, turn to a book in the Bible called 2 Corinthians. Right after 1 Corinthians, it's about 8 or 9 or 10 books past Matthew, okay? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Because what we're going to do today is we're going to study a situation that illustrates exactly what repentance is and exactly what repentance does. Because you, I owe it to you, if I don't do anything else today... When you walk out this door, you need to understand what repentance is and why Jesus said it is such a big deal. Now, as you're turning to, and by the way, if you didn't bring a copy of the Bible, no, no problem. We'll put the verses up on the screen in just a moment. Let me give you the background of the story. Paul founded this church in Corinth. By the way, I'm going to Greece next year. Some of you are going with me. I'd love to have a lot of you go. It's a great trip. One of the cities that we'll visit is the ancient city of Corinth. Paul founds this city in uh, this church in Corinth, and, 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 but, but the, a problem came up. There was a man that had committed a very, very serious, egregious sin, and, and, and the problem was the church didn't deal with it. The church kind of stuck its head in the sand and just we hoped the, church, the problem would go away, and they wouldn't deal with it. Well, it upset Paul. And so Paul, Paul wrote a letter to this church. It's in 1 Corinthians, and Paul said, I got a problem. You've got sin in the body. You're not dealing with it. Sin in the body is like cancer to a body. You've got to get rid of the cancer. You've got a man in your church, and you know he's living in sin, a very terrible, egregious sin. You know it. The community knows it. Insiders know it. Outsiders know it. And you're not dealing with it. And because you're not dealing with it, you've now become a part of the problem. And I'm telling you, you have a biblical responsibility to take care of this problem. And he rebukes the church because they hadn't taken care of the problem. Well, he hadn't heard back. He did not know whether they had responded or not or done what they were supposed to do. So he sends a protege by the name of Titus. He said, Titus, I can't go. I want you to go for me. Find out the lay of the land. See if they did what they asked, I asked them to do. See if they're even speaking to me anymore. I mean, Paul did not know. He didn't know. Maybe he just kind of blown everything up in his relationship with him. 
Well, the good news is they had dealt with it. And in dealing with it, they give us a model on how sin is to be dealt with in the right way if we're going to deal with our faults correctly. So let me just say this. This is who I'm talking to this morning. If you're in a relationship that's been ruptured, you're in a friendship that's been fractured, and you know it is your fault, or at least a big part of it is your fault, you've got to ask yourself two questions this morning. Number one, does this relationship mean enough for me and to me for me to do whatever I need to do to fix the problem? Now, if the answer is no, you can check out. You can get on your iPad and just, you know, check yesterday's Georgia score. It's a great read, okay? But if you want to do that, that's fine, okay? You don't need to listen to me. However, if you're saying no, I really want to know, how do I fix this relationship? I'm the one at fault, or at least I've got a lot of the fault. How do I fix it? That's the first thing I'm asking. The second thing is, do you want to fix it right? Do you want to fix it where it can stay fixed? Well, well yes, I do. Okay, then here's what I want you to hear. This is the takeaway. When we turn to God, we turn from sin. There's no debate, no discussion. You can't do one without the other. When we turn to God, we turn from sin. And that turn from sin is called repentance. And see, here's the problem. There's some of you right now here on our campus or you're at the Mill Creek campus or you're watching by live stream right now and you think you've dealt with your sin. You think it's all good because you've confessed it to God. But you're, you've got a problem and you know what that problem is, right? You keep repeating the same mistake. You confess what you've done wrong and then go back and do it again. You confess what you've done wrong, you go back and do it again. You hurt somebody, you offend somebody, you say, okay, I'm sorry I hurt you, I'm sorry I offended you, I won't do that anymore. Then you go back and you do it again and you keep wondering why. Why is it I keep confessing and nothing really happens? Why do I continue to do this and why do I continue to feel guilty? It's because you've never repented. Confession alone won't do it. You've got to repent. There's some of you in this room right now, you're a Christian, you love Jesus, you know Jesus, but you're living a totally defeated Christian life. You know deep down you're not hitting on all eight cylinders spiritually. You know deep down you're not getting all out of the Christian life you ought to get, and God's certainly not getting all of you out of you he ought to get, and you can't kind of figure it out. And the reason why is you've never experienced this seismic shift that's the only real remedy for your fault. Let me illustrate it to you this way. If you're going down a street and you decide you're going to turn off that street, no matter whether you turn right or left, I don't care. If you go down a street, if you turn left or right, the moment you turn onto one street, you just turn off the other street. You can't turn onto one street and stay on the other street. You turn on one, you got to get off the other one. Same thing is true with God. You cannot come to God and say, God, I'm coming to you today, but I'm holding on to my sin. If you get off one street, you got to get off the other. You can't stay on the same street. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you repent? What does that mean? All right, here we go. Ready? Boom. Here we go. Number one, we must truly realize our sin. That's step one. We've got to truly realize our sin. Now, Paul does the church a big favor. They didn't like it at the time, but Paul knows what I know and what you need to know. And that is when somebody's living in sin, I'm talking about a brother who says, I don't mean somebody you know, that's lost because they ought to be living in sin. That's what they do, right? But if you know a, a brother or a sister in the family of God and they're living in sin, somebody that claims to be a Christian, Paul says, you do a loving thing when you go to that person in humility but in love and you confront them and let them know exactly what they've done. That's what Paul did. Paul goes to this church and he said, look, I'm your spiritual father. I led many of you to Christ. I helped form this church. I helped to get you started. And I'm telling you right now, you are not doing the right thing. There is sin in the church. You've not dealt with it. You've got a biblical responsibility to deal with it. I am asking you to deal with it, and I'm going to tell you exactly how to deal with it. Well, as I told you, he was kind of afraid. I burned bridges. They've gotten mad. They're not speaking to me. They've rejected me. They turned their back on me. So he sends Titus. Titus says, hey, good news, Paul. They, they not only love you, they know they did wrong, they've done the right thing, they corrected the problem, and they want you to know they can't wait to see you again, right? So far, so good. Then Paul says something very strange to this church, real strange. Listen, verse 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, that is the, the letter he wrote in 1 Corinthians, I don't regret it. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You made them sad and you made them mad, but you're happy about it. I don't regret it, all right? Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a little while. Now, that's kind of odd. 
Paul says, you know, it bothers me that I really made you cry, but not really. It, it bothered me that I broke your heart, but I got over it. it took me a half a baby aspirin to go to sleep. I mean, it re really did not bother me at all. You say, well, okay, what was Paul saying? Here's what he was saying. He was saying, you know what? He said, grief and sorrow are signs of a broken heart. And he said, it is a wonderful thing that when you sin, you have a broken heart. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. When we sin, we ought to have a broken heart for one reason. Because our sin breaks the heart of God. And Paul said, even though it hurt me to hurt you, it actually made me glad that you were hurt. And let me tell you why. Because the fact that you were hurt, the fact that you were grieved, the fact that you sorrow tells me you realized your sin. You realized what you had done was wrong. You realized it was sin. You realized you'd committed sin. And that is a good thing. And let me tell you why that's so important for us. This, this is a little bit deep, but listen. When the concept of sin is diminished, the practice of sin is increased. When the practice of sin is increased, the guilt and the shame over sin disappears. Now, I don't know whether you realize this or not. I've lived long enough to see it. We're living today in a culture where, by and large, shame and guilt over sin has become basically a thing of the past. Someone, used, someone as well said, sin that used to sneak down the back alley now struts up the main street. Why is that? I told you last week. <clears throat> because sin is no longer a sin. Sin's a mistake. Sin's a faulty judgment. Sin's a miscalculation. You may have seen it this week. I was watching, uh, 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 there's a, a manager. I'm not here to throw down on this guy. I'm praying for him. But there's, you may have seen him. There was a manager of a major league baseball team that, that resigned this week for personal reasons. They didn't know why. He calls a press conference on Thursday. I'm watching his press conference. Man gets up. And he says, uh, look, I'm not going to take any questions, but let me tell you why I've resigned as manager of this baseball team. And he said, this is his words, I have broken, he'd been married to his wife 40-something years, he said, I have broken trust with my wife. Now, I'm sitting here watching this, and I'm going, hey, man, okay, you're on the right track, man, you're on the right road. Anybody want to take a guess what the next, thing words out, what next words were out of his mouth? What do you think he said? I made a mistake. I wanted to throw my shoe at the television. Dude. You didn't make a mistake. You sinned. You broke a commandment. You sinned against God and you sinned against your wife. We don't do that anymore. And when we fail to realize what sin is and call it sin, we also lose the power to properly ask for forgiveness of sin. That's why we don't even know how to apologize in our culture anymore. Listen, you don't apologize for a mistake. A mistake's a mistake. You apologize for sin. And that shouldn't really surprise anyone because until you realize sin for what it is and call it what it is, you will never take the proper steps to get forgiveness and have your fellowship with God restored. And by the way, I, 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 let me just be honest. I know there's some of you out there right now and you're struggling with a stronghold in your life. You're tired of the guilt trip you're on. You confess your mess. You fess up to your mess up, but you keep messing up. And you just can't seem to get off this, 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 this treadmill of temptation. And you keep going back and doing the same thing. Well, step one is you've got to confess it for what it is. Lord, this is a stronghold in my life. I need you to help me break this in my life or else you'll never get on the road to redemption. So step one is we've got to truly realize our sin. All right, step two. We must sincerely regret our sin. We realize our sin, then we regret our sin. Now, I'm going to say something I know is very obvious. There's something desperately wrong with somebody that can hurt people and it doesn't bother them. They, these terrorists over there, that are these, these gutless cowards that are beheading people over there in Syria. In a way, I feel sorry for them. I'm going to tell you something. A man's to be pitied that can do what they're doing and go to sleep at night and not, not bother them. They can eat and, 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 and think they're doing God a favor. I mean, that's really kind of a, a sad situation. And anybody would say this. If you're, if you're a normal person with a normal conscience and you do something wrong, you ought to feel sorry about it. But then Paul does something that's so unusual and so amazing. He said, you know what? There's actually two kinds of sorrow over sin. He said there is a type of sorrow that leads to the free way of forgiveness 
But then there's a type of sorrow that leads to a dead end to death. Now listen to what he says beginning in verse 9. He says, as it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved. He says, I'm not sorry that you were sorry. I'm glad you were. But because you were grieved into, what's that word? Repenting. Repenting. For you felt a godly grief. We'll come back to that in a moment. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief, there's that phrase again, produces what? A repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, Paul says something that a lot of us have never thought about. There's a big difference between worldly grief and godly grief, worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Now, let me give you an illustration here, and I want all of us to be honest, okay? All of us be honest right now. Have you ever, looking back in your life, have you ever been caught, ever, doing something that you should not have done? You were caught doing something wrong. Listen. But you weren't sorry that you were doing what you were doing. You were sorry that you got caught for doing what you were doing. Now, can I get a witness to that? Hold your hand up. And if you don't hold your hand up right now, you are a liar. You're lying through your teeth. Okay? Everybody in this room would say that. Everybody in this room, you can think back. There was a time you were doing something wrong. You knew it was wrong. No doubt it was wrong. You got caught, but you were not grieved and hurt and sorry and sad because you got caught doing the wrong thing. You weren't sorry because you were doing the wrong thing. You were sorry because you got caught. Paul said, that's not the kind of sorrow that's going to cut it. That's not the kind of sorrow that's going to work. Now, you're sitting there, and you may be saying, well, can I ask you a question, Pastor? How do I know if that's the kind of sorrow that I have? How do I know that I've got a worldly sorrow and not a godly sorrow? There are some sure tail signs, sure fire marks. That's the kind of sorrow you've got. Here, let me give you an example. For example, worldly sorrow will lead to denial. Worldly sorrow will make you say something like this. Well, everybody does it. Oh, here, here's one of my favorite ones. That really isn't me. Newsflash, it is. Yeah, that really is you. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Yep, that's you. It really is you. Or, uh, you know, I thought about it. It's just not that big of a deal. Or, I just don't think what I did is really all that bad. That, that's worldly sorrow. Here's another one. It leads to despair. Here's, here's a mark of worldly sorrow. You do something wrong. You get caught doing something wrong, and all of a sudden, you are so sorry, you are so brokenhearted. You know why? Because of the consequences that you know you've got to suffer because you got caught. So here's what worldly sorrow says. Oh, no. I'm going to lose my marriage. Oh, no. I'm going to lose my job. Oh, no. I'm going to lose my kids. Oh, no. I'm going to jail. Because when you're full of worldly sorrow, here's all you can think about. You think about what your sin has done to you. And then even worse, Paul said, there's a worldly sorrow that leads to death. Because here's what Paul said. Whenever we sin, whenever we do something wrong, and then we try to explain it, or we try to justify it, or we try to excuse it, or we try to deny it, it kills our conscience, it kills our soul, and it blocks us from the very thing that we need to do in order to get forgiveness and have fellowship with God. So I, tried, I was thinking as I was working on this sermon, I got to thinking, how can I really explain to my people what worldly sorrow is? And it hit me. Have you ever heard the term crocodile tears? Crocodile, you've heard that term? Well, I went back. Did my research. I worked. Where'd that term come from? Are you ready for this? I didn't know this. Maybe you knew it. I didn't know this. Did you know crocodiles shed crocodile tears? I didn't know that. Let me tell you what I found out. As a matter of fact, I was going to put a picture up here of a crocodile with a tear, but I hate gators, so I just didn't do that. <laughs> but, but, but let me tell you, there are real tears. They, there's a picture. You can see a tear in a crocodile's eye. You know why they have tears? Because if a crocodile stays out of water very long, their eyes begin to dry out. And when their eyes begin to dry out, they, 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 their body naturally secretes a fluid to clean that eye and to lubricate it. So if you ever see a crocodile with a tear in his eye, he ain't broken hearted. Okay? He's just dried out. 
He just needs to, some lubrication. That's what worldly sorrow is. It's crocodile tears. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that people don't truly feel sorry for their sin in a very worldly way. Paul didn't say that. Paul said, look, I'm not saying that worldly sorrow is not real sorrow. What I'm saying is it's the wrong kind of sorrow because it does not lead to repentance. Great illustration, Judas. Judas is the classic biblical illustration of what it means to have worldly sorrow. Judas, Judas denies Jesus, 30 pieces of silver. After he denies Jesus, he realizes he has done wrong. He's genuinely remorseful. He is sorry. His heart was broken. I have no doubt he was really, in a worldly way, very sorry for what he did. Remember what he does? He goes to the priest, you know, and, 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 and he tells, man, I've done the wrong thing. But then what happens? He commits suicide. His worldly sorrow led to death. Instead of going to the one that hung on a cross, he goes and hangs himself on a tree. Here's the way his life ended. You know the story, Matthew 24. He goes to the priest and says, look, I have sinned. No doubt, he really meant it. He knows, I've blown it. I blew it. It's my fault by betraying innocent blood and throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple. He departed and he went and hanged himself. Now, I did something I thought kind of interesting. I went back and changed that. And I want you to imagine that instead of reading the way I just read it, what if it had read this way? I have sinned by betraying innocent blood and throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple. He departed and went and repented and asked for forgiveness. Do you think his story would have ended differently? Do you think he might be in heaven today? Do you think he would have found the forgiveness he was looking for? Absolutely. Well, why didn't he? Because he didn't have a godly sorrow. He had a worldly sorrow. And listen, if you don't hear anything else I say, here's what I want you to hear. Now, this is hard and this is tough, but I want you to hear this. The next time you blow it, the next time you do wrong, the next time you're the one that, that messed it up, you're the one that caused the rupture in the relationship, God does not want you feeling sorry for yourself God wants you feeling sorry for your sin. God does not want you feeling sorry because of what your sin may do to you. He wants you to feel sorry for what your sin has done to him. God doesn't want you to feel sorry because you've broken your heart. He wants you to feel sorry because you've broken his heart. That is a godly grief. In the original Greek language, it means an according to God grief. See, worldly grief has you as the focus. Godly grief has God as the focus. So let me put it to you this way. Worldly grief says, oops, I broke the law. Godly grief says, oh God, I broke your heart. Worldly grief says, what's going to happen to me? Godly grief says, God, what have I done to you? And there's a difference between tears that leave you where you are and tears that move you where you need to be. Now, I'm going to skip over a couple of things because I want to kind of get to this third point because there's one last thing we have to do. And that is we must fully repent of our sin. We must fully repent of our sin. I'm going to, I'm going to get this real brief. Listen up. There is something wrong with people. We've already said this. They do wrong to people. They feel no remorse, no regret, no shame. But we've already said now there are two different kinds of sorrow. There's a divine sorrow and there's a deadly sorrow. And Paul says, all right, let me remind you of the difference. He says, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, this is where you've got to really hang with me because if this is a big deal to Jesus, and it is, if it's a big deal to us, and it ought to be, then I want you to walk out of here in a moment and truly understand what repentance is. So if somebody were to come up to you and they were to say, hey, I want to repent, but I don't even know how to do it or what that means, I want you to be able to explain exactly what that is. Because there are a lot of you that don't even understand repentance you think you have and you have it. So let me give you an example. Repentance involves or includes conviction. You've you got to realize that you've sinned. However, you can be genuinely convinced you've done wrong and convicted that you've done wrong, but that's not repentance. Repentance involves confession. Yes, if you're going to repent, one of the things you have to do, we've already said, you've got to confess. However, you, confess, you can confess openly, you can confess publicly that you've done wrong, but if that's all you do, that's not repentance. Repentance involves contrition. 
Yes, you ought to feel sorry when you've done wrong. There ought, to be a, a, you ought to, there, there ought to be a broken heart within you. You ought to really feel sorry that you've done wrong. However, you can genuinely feel sorry and be grieved over your sin. You can say, I'm so sorry I hurt you. I'm so sorry that I caused this fracture. But that alone is not repentance. Okay, you ready? Repentance always involves change. Change, not just confession, not just conviction, not just contrition. Repentance always involves change. Now, you know what the word, many of you probably heard the word repent means to change your mind. All right, let me tell you exactly what happens. Let's say you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. We had a man who came to our 915 service, had never been saved. Came up, met me after the service, lives in Birmingham, Alabama. Came up, met me after the service. I said to him, I said, can I ask you a question? I said, do you know for sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? He said, I not only not know that, I know if I died today, I wouldn't go to heaven. I said, would you like to know that? He said, I absolutely would like to know that. And one of our men out there led him to Christ, you know, right after the service. What happened to that guy? He changed his mind. He changed his mind about God. He changed his mind about Jesus. He changed his mind about his sin. He changed his mind about himself. He changed his mind. But it's not just a solely intellectual issue. Judas changed his mind. He said, I've done wrong. I thought I did right, but I did wrong. Well, then what happened to him? Why did he die when he didn't have to die? Because even though he changed his mind, he never changed his heart. We've already seen it's, 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 it's an emotional change. You can feel sorry for your sin. But, but you don't just regret what you've done. You regret to whom you've done it to. It's not a worldly grief that's self-centered. It is a godly grief that is God-centered. You don't grieve because of what it may do to you or the consequences you may suffer. You grieve because of what it's done to God. But here's what I want you to hear. Real repentance involves a spiritual change. Because you say, well, how do I know if I've really repented? It's real easy. When you change your mind and you change your heart, you'll change your direction. When you change your mind and you change your heart, you change your direction. You do an about face. You do a 180. Just like Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery. You remember what he said to her? I don't condemn you. Really? Nope. You're forgiven. Wait, wait. Time out. Don't leave. Go and sin no more. What was he saying to her? Repent. Don't, whatever you did that brought you in here, don't let me see you in here again. You repent. If, you really, if you're really sorry for what you've done and God's really worked in your heart, there will be a change of direction in your life. So I'm going to wrap all this up by talking now to two different groups of people. There are some of you in this room right now, and you think you've done everything necessary on the outside to make sure you're right with God. You go to church or you've joined a church. You've been baptized. You, you grew up religious. You are religious. You, you work in the church or you have worked in the church. You've given money to the church or you give money to the church. But there's something that bothers you. And you know what bothers you? There's never really been a change in your life. You signed a card. You jumped in a baptistry. You did this. You did that. You do all the right things you need, to do, you, 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 you need to do today. But somehow you know in my life there's never been a real change. I know what your problem is. You've never repented. And then there are other of us in this room. And, and, and really, you do love Jesus. You do know Jesus, and you do want to live for Jesus, but here's your problem. You've got this little pet sin, and you kind of keep it hidden in a closet. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's your temper. Maybe it's your impatience. Maybe it's your cold indifference. Maybe it's your sex life. Maybe it's your social life. And you want to hold on to that sin. You want to kind of keep that on a leash. And it's our pride that keeps us from going to someone. Or maybe you've wronged someone and you know you've wronged someone. And you know you've never really truly forget, asked forgiveness in the right way. You've never gone to that person. You've not just said, I'm, by the way, saying I'm sorry is not an apology. Let me get that straight. That is not an apology. Here's an apology. It's when you go to someone and you say, this is exactly what I've done to you. I did this, 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 and this. I am telling you it's wrong. I'm not only asking God to forgive me, I'm asking you to forgive me. And with the grace of God, I am never going to do that again. That is an apology. That's repentance. And some of us have never done that. And the reason why, even though we're Christians, even though we are, even though we know the Lord, we're not experiencing the joy and the freedom and the excitement we ought to have is because we refuse to repent. So here's what I want to ask you to do. This is cheesy, but just bear with me. 
Everybody take out an imaginary mirror right now and just hold it right in front of you. Okay, everybody do that. You've got a mirror. You're looking yourself in the mirror, okay? Here's the question I want you to ask right now. You're looking yourself in the mirror. Here's the question I want you to ask right now. Is there anything that I need to truly repent of in my life in order to have a 100% uninterrupted fellowship with God? Is there anything in my life I need to truly repent of in order to have a 100% uninterrupted fellowship with God? So if you're here today and you're ne you've never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I am not going to stand up here and simply tell you, all you got to do is just quote unquote believe in Jesus and you'll be good to go. There are a lot of people who believe in Jesus who are not good to go because there's two sides to that coin. Faith is one side, repentance is the other. When you turn to, you turn from. So here's what I'm going to say and then we're going to say amen. Don't be like the wife that I read about. And before she, gave, before she supposedly converted to Christ, she was just hellacious to live with. She nagged her husband. She berated her husband. She criticized her husband. She put her husband down. She just sucked all the life out of him. She came home from church one day, and she said to her husband, I have become a Christian. He was so excited. He was so pumped. He said, man, this is awesome. Things have got to get better. The only problem was nothing changed. She kept nagging him, and she kept berating him, and she kept putting him down, and she kept criticizing him. And finally one day he looked at her and he said, you know, I don't mind that you've been born again. I just wish you had been born again as yourself. When you repent, truly repent, there is a seismic shift that will take place in your heart and you can't and won't ever be the same again. This October, join Dr. James Merritt and friends in beautiful Branson, Missouri for the 2021 Mountaintop Conference. This Ozark City offers something for everyone from world-class dining and live entertainment to unique shopping and outdoor recreation. There is an adventure waiting for you. This event will feature powerful preaching daily from Dr. Merritt, and joining him will be his friend, Bellevue Baptist Church's Dr. Steve Gaines. You will also get to hear from the legendary Oak Ridge Boys when they stop by to share some of their story. Enjoy incredible music from Grammy Award-winning Guy Penrod and one of Christian music's biggest artists, Crowder. Visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details and reserve your spot today. the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.